You're listening to the Fertility Docs Uncensored Podcast, featuring insight on all things fertility from some of the top-rated doctors around America. Whether you're struggling to conceive or just planning for your future family, we're here to guide you every step of the way. Today's podcast is brought to you by Ovation Fertility, a leader in the field of IVF lab services. Ovation partners with some of America's leading fertility specialists to provide a range of services to support fertility treatment, including fertility testing, IVF, egg donation, surrogacy, genetic testing, and long-term storage of reproductive material. You can learn more about Ovation at OvationFertility.com. This is Dr. Susan Hudson from Texas Fertility Center with another episode of Fertility Docs Uncensored. And I am joined today with my amazing co-host, Dr. Abby Eblen from Nashville Fertility Center. Hi, everybody. And Dr. Carrie Bedient from Fertility Center of Las Vegas. And we have a special guest today. We are so excited to have Dr. Mark Ratner with us. Hey, Mark. Hello. How are you guys doing? Fabulous. Good, good. So Mark is a urologist and he is also the chief science officer of a company called Theralogic. So we're going to learn all about Theralogics and learn a bit about vitamins and, and all that kind of good stuff. But hey, Mark, you were mentioning that you are delving into some sort of ancestry research. Yeah, I, it's uh, it's kind of funny because it it's an area that my background in genetics and fertility sort of led me into. I had been for many years doing sort of typical, you know, like sort of standard genealogy work where you, you know, you're online and you're looking at things like census records and ships passenger lists and stuff like that. They're very hard to read, aren't they? <laughs> oh, yeah. The old handwriting can be challenging. But, you know, all that stuff is online. And so it's been uh, sort of a hobby of mine for a number of years. But then more recently, there's been an explosion in what's called genetic genealogy. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of publicity lately, a lot of media uh, attention to old crimes that are actually being solved because of genetic genealogy. And what with the ability for, you know, you can go on 23andMe, you can go on Ancestry DNA, you can go on MyHeritage. There's about five or six different companies that will, for you know, 70 or $80, they'll sequence your DNA. And then a few weeks later, you get a long list of all of these people who you are theoretically related to. And you know, when that list first comes in, you look at it and you say, who are all these people? <laughs> uh, because the names aren't always going to be familiar to you. Most of them won't be, but they're all typically going to be second cousins, third cousins, fourth cousins, where you share potentially a set of great-grandparents or great-great-grandparents. So it's really fascinating stuff. And what got me into the genetic genealogy of it was that I have a daughter who she's actually now a, a doc. And we were having dinner one night about three or four years ago. And her phone rang and it was a genealogy researcher through Ancestry DNA. She had gotten her DNA done. And on the phone was a genealogy researcher who basically unloaded some information on our family, which was like completely out of left field. This woman had a client, was a 70-year-old woman who was trying to find her birth parents. She had been adopted at birth and she was looking for her birth parents and she had her DNA done. And my daughter who had her DNA had been done like a year earlier, came up as a match saying that they were like third cousins. Wow. Wow. And Nobody in my family, it's actually, it turned out to be on my wife's side of the family, but nobody in the family had any idea that there was a child that had been born and given up for adoption in the 1930s. So it was wild. And it took a, it took several weeks to figure out what was going on, whose child this had actually had been. Yeah. It was crazy, but it really got me very interested in, in sort of understanding how genealogy can be done using genetic testing. Yeah. That is so exciting. My mom has been doing a lot of genealogy and she's been doing some of this with her DNA and that type of thing. And my mom was born in Germany because that's where my grandparents happened to be after the war. They're from Lithuania. My two older aunts were born in Lithuania my mom grew up not knowing anybody because they came over to the United States and they really had no contact with the relations because it was so far away. Yeah. Well, it was behind the Soviet wall. Oh yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Know? And so there was very little interaction, only letters from limited people and things like this. And so 
my mom has gotten, I mean, she's in her seventies and she's met like cousins and spouses of like other family members through this type of thing. And she's been working on like just the handwritten ancestry stuff. We found out that we're related to Helen Keller through my dad's side of the family, which was like super cool. Wow. My kids thought that is fantastic. And it really makes you know how small a world it is. Yeah, absolutely. It's an amazing gift, but you always have to be prepared for those phone calls, just like you mentioned, because you you never know what's going to be around the corner. And when you do your DNA and they send you those lists, there's now they provide a disclaimer basically saying, <laughs> you uh, never know what you're going to find out. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And sort of like be prepared and, you know, be, be aware that you may discover something that you're not entirely happy to learn. Okay. Um, yeah. And there's somewhere in the three to 5% range of mistaken paternity where, you know, you thought so-and-so was your dad and it turns out he wasn't. <laughs> I was telling our ladies on the podcast, I read this book called Inheritance. And it oh, was, great book. Have you read that? But that is such a good book. I think it, it was so eye-opening to, you know, because for many, many years, we've talked to couples about using donor sperm and donor eggs and donor embryos. And I mean, you do think about it from the child's perspective, but we always said, you know, it's really important to let your child know because, you know, secrets can get out. Of course, back when I started out 20 years ago, we never knew that things like Ancestry.com and 23andMe would even exist. And so, yeah, it's it's amazing the, the secrets and things that, that patients can find out. But I have a question for you since you're an expert in this area. I've also done mitochondrial DNA, which really, I, it hasn't really given me any revelations about anything. It's just kind of, do you know much about that at all? Or Yeah. So the main tests, the ones that you would get through 23andMe or Ancestry, those are autosomal. Right. They basically look at SNPs, you know, single yeah. nucleotide polymorphisms in the autosomal DNA. But you can also have Y chromosome. Men can have their Y chromosome sequenced. Okay. Uh, and anybody can have their mitochondrial DNA. Okay, the problem is that mitochondrial DNA is much harder to use because both men and women have mitochondrial DNA. Right. Y DNA, Y chromosome DNA, is a perfect indicator of patch, what they call patrilineal descent. In other words, I just, it's interesting, I just had a, uh, my family uh, is on my father's side from Belarus. Mm -hmm. And I just, have been in touch with a, a researcher in Southern California who happens to have done, she actually paid researchers in Belarus to go to the archives there and dig through material on my last name, Ratner, you know, the Ratner family. And she has this amazing family tree that she just shared with me. Wow. And my first reaction to it was, did he show you all of the documentation for this or did he just like <laughs> did he just somebody say, just came up with it yeah uh, here, here's a family tree and now you you know pay me the thousands of dollars you know that <laughs> yeah. I've, right that i've negotiated with you and what we're talking about is the fact that if we can find some other people with my same last name men who have my same last name who are alive today and we can do dna on our y chromosomes from that same tree my y chromosome should be identical to that other guys. Oh, interesting. Because my Y chromosome, there's no recombination on Y chromosomes. Oh. And there's no recombination on mitochondrial DNA either. But the problem is that it's both men and women. In other words, all the mitochondria in an embryo come from the egg, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, that, that gets back to a whole thing about energetics and CoQ10, but we'll talk about that. So one last question while you're on that topic. So if you descended from the same grandfather or great-grandfather, you would have the same Y chromosome that somebody else would? Unchanged. I didn't know that. My Y chromosome is identical to my father's. Okay. And his father's and his father's, right? It just goes back. And so the only changes that occur in the Y chromosome are due to mutation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not recombination. The autosomes, they cross over. They have a mutation. And they also have mutation. But the crossover is really what makes the autosomal DNA vary from one generation to the mm -hmm. next. With Y chromosomes, what they had done is they basically mapped the mutations, which are SNPs also, okay? They're, they're basically single nucleotide polymorphisms, but they map those and they develop what they call haplotypes. And so if you can go back far enough, you can use the Y chromosomes to basically build a family tree that goes back hundreds and done hundreds of years. Wow. That's cool. Yeah, because they don't recombine. I didn't realize that. Well, very good. That was interesting. I learned some things. 
It's great <laughs> stuff. I love it. Yeah. Let's do our question of the day before we kind of dive into some vitamin stuff. Um, our question is how does, or can being ANA positive affect fertility? Trying to conceive for over a year after successful pregnancy, diagnosed with unicornate uterus and ANA positive, one to 320 titer speckled pattern after birth of son. So when people talk about autoimmunity, I tend to think more about women who have recurrent pregnancy loss. And I think this patient has sort of two potential issues when it comes to recurrent pregnancy loss not so much fertility, but recurrent pregnancy loss. So, you know, we know if there's high titers of lupus anticoagulant and anticardiolipin antibodies, we know that that's particularly in a person who's had recurrent pregnancy loss. We know that that's the one condition where those patients would really benefit from a blood thinner. We used to use heparin more commonly, but now we tend to use Lovenox because it's a safer medication and it tends to improve outcomes. Patients traditionally have more problems with delivering babies early, pregnancy loss, second trimester loss, Unicornate uterus is sort of a confounding factor because generally if there's a uterine abnormality, we tend to believe that it's more related to um, a second trimester loss. So it's interesting that this listener is asking this after the birth of her child. Does she give any information about that or? No, it was just exactly what I put. Okay. So with the unicornate uterus, the other point to point out or other thing to say is that um, just with any Mullerian abnormality, meaning, you know, the two tubes have to go together, the Mullerian tubes, they fuse in the midline to form the uterus. And clearly in this situation, if they have a unicornate uterus, only one of the tubes was present. So there's only one tube. There's two ovaries, but one tube and one uterus. And we know that it can make it more likely that that person can miscarry. For some reason, no matter what the uterine malformation is, the uterus is weaker and it just doesn't hold the pregnancy as long in some situations. And so certainly if you have a unicorn uterus, your doctor is going to want to check your cervix early on before you get too far along just to make sure there's not early dilatation and then just continue to check it by measuring it, you know, when she does ultrasounds. But it sounds like you've had a child, so that's a good thing. <laughs> you've proven that, you know, the, both of those two things can be overcome. So that's great news. The other thing that we oftentimes see is that when someone is just looking for a double-stranded DNA, that is a screening test of the lightest order in the sense that if that comes back positive, oftentimes the next thing that the rheumatologist will do is they'll order a more comprehensive panel. And the rheumatologists are some of the queens of an amazing number of lab tests and so and all of these antibodies. And so they will dive into it further and look and see, you know, are there SSA and SSB antibodies? Are there all of these different types of antibodies that could indicate, is this a double-stranded DNA that is related to a specific disorder or not? And so I'm kind of curious about what the underlying reason is and why they ordered the test in the first place. And I'm guessing there's some recurrent pregnancy loss component to it, just because that is usually what's related to it. You know, there may be a really strong family history of autoimmune diseases, but it's a, it's a very nonspecific test. And so that by itself, I don't think means a whole lot in terms of taking action and, and doing sp something specific. I think it's more of a, well, let's look into this further and see if any of this autoimmune panel comes up positive. And unfortunately, in the absence of symptoms, it's really hard to pin some of this down because the lab work goes positive and negative and can vary. I mean, there's a reason that the rheumatologists are- <laughs> Exist, right? <laughs> booked out forever and ever, amen, and they exist because they are- like it's a, it is a tough field that's very intricate with all of the different tests that you can do and how to interpret symptoms in combination with the tests done over time. It's not a one and done thing. It's a usually takes several months kind of thing to figure out. Yeah, I would agree that when I see a positive ANA by itself, I'm assuming all the other things have been done as you know, you guys talked about, but in the absence of the other things being positive, it really is so nonspecific that it really, I mean, I don't think has any tangible evidence to make us really concerned about something. You know, there's, there are the inherent risks of a unicornate uterus, but it sounds like you've already delivered a baby there. But if you've been trying for a year and in light of those things, you know, definitely be visiting with your reproductive endocrinologist. Now you're the person we definitely don't want pregnant with multiples. <laughs> Amen to that. So that's going to play a part in the decision-making tree of, you know, what types of treatments might be best suited for you. But, you know, at, at this point, I think things sound pretty good. So, all right, well, let's kind of dive into, tell us a little bit about Theralogics and we're going to kind of focus on things like CoQ10 today, but um, kind of give us a little bit of background of who you guys are. Sure. 
So Theralogix is based in the Washington, D.C. area, and actually the Maryland suburbs right outside. We started the company about 20 years ago, and it was started by a, a group of physicians. Our initial focus was really on urology and men's health. And the background was that at the point that we started the company, there was a ton of research being published about the impact of specific nutrients on prostate cancer risk. And so we got together a bunch of docs from some of the teaching programs in the mid-Atlantic here and a couple of community physicians and said, you know, really interesting science that's kind of evolving here. Unfortunately, the supplement world, the dietary supplement world is sort of filled with a lot of questionable players. As it still is now. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. And and so we said, you know, we, we talked to these guys of from the academic programs and said, would you be willing to work with us if we created a company that would sort of vet the science carefully? And then the other thing that we decided that we would do uh, at the outset is have any products that we were going to develop be independently third-party content certified, which is another thing that doesn't happen in the vast majority of the supplement industry. So we started this company and initially we focused on prostate health. We recruited a medical advisory board which included a couple of department chairmen from teaching programs in the Mid-Atlantic. And then within a few years, it, we became you know, pretty successful initially. And then within a few years, we developed a male fertility product based on science that was really kind of being published about the impact of certain antioxidants on improving uh, DNA fragmentation and sperm and, and similar things. And so then from male fertility, we sort of started expanding into the world of uh, female fertility. And now the company really has, I would say, five different specialties that we kind of work pretty closely with. Urology, reproductive endocrinology, meaning the fertility world, rheumatology, pain management, then standard OBGYN. So we do a really robust line of different prenatal vitamins. We're actually now getting into the cannabinoid space. There's some very interesting data on non-cannabis-derived cannabinoids. <laughs> Where do you find cannabinoids not from cannabis? Okay. So uh, th this is going to be a little parenthetical. We're going to go off on this tangent, but I'm, I love the topic, so I'm happy to, to get into it. Um, Carrie, is this a personal question or is this for our, for our listeners? I'm just curious. I mean, I do live in Vegas and, you know, I... Uh, <laughs> I see all of the things. And so knowing about <laughs> alternatives to these. Isn't there like a big cannabis museum in Vegas or something? I think I've read that. There's a museum for everything in Vegas. Like there's a museum <laughs> of erotic art history. There's a museum of just about everything. So <laughs> I'll give you what we call the Cliff Notes version very quickly. It turns out, okay, the reason why cannabis has any effect on the human body is because we have receptors in our tissues, which are called cannabinoid receptors. And it's what THC and CBD, those are the two primary chemicals that are in cannabis. That's what they bind to. So the question then became, you know, years ago, maybe about 40, 50 years ago, why do we have those receptors for chemicals that are just found in this one particular plant? And it, <laughs> it turns out that the reason we have those receptors is because we make our own cannabinoid ligands. In other words, we make oh, okay. our own signaling molecules in our tissues that are designed to bind to those receptors that we have. And those, the two primary cannabinoid ligands were discovered by an Israeli scientist in the early 90s. One is called anandamide, and ananda is the Sanskrit word for bliss. No coincidence there, I'm guessing. <laughs> he named it that because it binds to CD1 receptors, which are in the brain. The other ligand is called 2-AG. They're both derived from arachidonic acid, which is a, uh, it's a fatty acid in our tissues. Well, it turns out that there's a third one, which is called PEA. It's a fatty acid amide that's derived from palmitic acid. We make this in our own tissues. It functions in our tissues as an anti-inflammatory and analgesic, okay? Hmm. It was discovered back in the 1960s, but nobody really understood the mechanism of action. There were so much other better things in the 60s. <laughs> Why would you focus on just pot when all the other alternatives so, are out there? PEA, palmitoyl ethanolamide, this is that third endogenous cannabinoid. This is a cannabinoid that we make in our tissues. So it's an endocannabinoid ligand. In other words, it's not in cannabis. The reason that we can create it as a supplement though, is because PEA is also found in soy, eggs, and peanuts. 
Huh. And be, because it's also found in certain foods, it's the only substance that we know of that's both an endogenous cannabinoid singling molecule, and it's also found exogenously. And so PEA uh, has been very widely used in Europe for about 20 years. There's a ton of data. I'm talking about randomized placebo-controlled trials that have been published, looking at endpoints like arthritis, sciatica, TMJ, uh, endometriosis. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, so there's a ton of... PEA uh, works by... It basically downregulates mast cell activity. It binds to cannabinoid receptors, which are on mast cells. And it prevents the mast cells from degranulating. And so you don't get the release of all of these inflammatory compounds that you normally would get when mast cells are activated. So Mark, what you're saying for people that don't understand all the science of it, this PEA is a good anti-inflammatory and Mm -hmm. it's also good for pain, right? Is that what you're saying? And it's, but it's not, but it doesn't specifically come from marijuana. Yeah. You can't find it in marijuana. It's not in marijuana. It's not in cannabis. Exactly. Gotcha. Okay. Hmm. So that's, you know, so we've gotten into the cannabinoids as well. And the rheumatologists love that product because it's got terrific data uh, for like osteoarthritis of the knee. Uh, there was a very big Australian study published about three years ago with that. And uh, yeah, so Therologics basically is, we, we've got a lot of different things that we do. So do you have a supplement purely that has that in it? Or is that a combination yeah. of some other supplement that you have? No, no, that we have a supplement that uh, we launched. Uh, it's called Canabrex. And Canabrex is pomatorial ethanolamide, uh, PEA, and it is 300 milligrams in a, in a capsule. Most of the studies that have been done with PEA have used 600 milligrams a day. Okay. So Canabrex is taken like one capsule BID. The one thing that is sort of important for the rheumatologist to understand this, but it is not a fast acting. This is not a rapid onset analgesic. This is not like taking ibuprofen or an NSAID or, you know, God forbid, an opioid. Okay. Yeah. This takes a while to build up tissue levels. And so the studies that have been done, depending on the endpoint, maximum benefit is going to take anywhere from two weeks to two months okay. for adequate tissue levels to build up. But yeah, no, so we're into cannabinoids a bit and um, yeah, we do a lot of interesting stuff. For a husband with rheumatoid arthritis, I'm going to go out and buy some. <laughs> so how did everything come about to, because you said you started off in the, the fertility space. So how did you go from all of the male, um, I don't want to say enhanced supplements, because that gives entirely supplements. supplements. Thank supplements. you. That is a much better word. Um, but how, like, how did you guys transitioned into CoQ10 and thinking about, all right, how does this impact women's fertility? From a, a business development perspective, what happened was we had built out our urology product line over the first, say, five or six years that we were in existence. And that line included a male fertility product. And I had begun at that point working with a large fertility practice in the Washington, D.C. area, and we were using the male fertility product with them. And in my conversations, uh, I mean, I was treating men, male fertility issues. And so in my conversations with the REIs that I worked with, I just started hearing more and more about data on things like vitamin D in women, the CoQ10 story, DHEA. And so that sort of triggered us to sort of start looking at that science and deciding whether there was enough support for expanding our product line into that area. We expanded our medical advisory board to include reproductive endocrinologists. And at this point, our medical advisory board is 15 physicians and scientists from, I think it's 11 different medical school faculties. Every one of our products goes through the board process. We don't produce a product unless the board signs off on formulation. And then the other thing is that every one of our products goes through independent content certification through a nonprofit program, which is up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It's called NSF International. NSF used to be part of the University of Michigan, and it's now a freestanding nonprofit. And so especially in a reproductive timeframe, you want to know that if you're taking an over-the-counter supplement, that what you think is in that pill is actually what's in that pill. So to that end, what should people look for when they're looking for a supplement is to know that, to know that very information that they're really getting what they think they're getting. So there are two programs in the United States, which are nonprofit independent certification programs. And if a company wants to go into those programs, it's a, it's a, 
you know, you have to sort of be very serious because that they're not only going to test your product for content accuracy and purity, but they're going to come and inspect your manufacturing facilities for what's called GMP compliance, good manufacturing practices compliance. The NSF program, which is the one that we're part of, also reviews all of our marketing materials Hmm. to make sure that we are within regulatory compliance, that we're not making the kinds of crazy health claims that you're not supposed to make. Overblown claims, yeah. (laughs) You mean just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's real? (laughs) I thought everything on the internet was true. You know, unfortunately, the FDA is completely outgunned by the supplement industry. Mm. They just cannot police it adequately. So I mentioned NSF. That's one program. What does that stand for? Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot here. I always think about National Science Foundation. (laughs) No, it is not that. Um, NSF (laughs) used to be part of the University of Michigan, and then it was spun off as a freestanding nonprofit, I think like 40 or 50 years ago. And it's called NSF International. And I think historically, like 50 or 60 years ago, it might have stood for the National Sanitation Foundation or something crazy like that. But they don't, it's just called NSF at this point. And in fact, NSF has a program which is called Certified for Sport, which is the only supplement certification program that's accepted by the uh, U.S. Anti-Doping Agency, the U.S. ADA. Huh, interesting. Wow. Which oversees all the Olympic testing and everything like that. So I was mentioning that there's two programs. One is NSF International. And if you go to a store and a, a particular product is NSF certified, you'll see the NSF logo on the label. The other program is USP. Oh, yeah. Which is U.S. Pharmacopeia. And those are both nonprofit programs. And so if you're looking for a supplement that you want to be able to trust the content, look for either one of those two logos on the bottle. So Mark, tell us about Coenzyme Q10. I am so excited to hear about it because I really, I recommend Coenzyme Q10 to my, a, lot of, a lot of my patients, but I always say, well, there's not a lot of randomized perspective data. This is the way we think it may work, but we really don't know if it really works in this way, but it, it's not going to hurt to take it. So Tell me what your thoughts are. Tell me your details that you know. Okay. So the first thing that, and I think this is a a factor that is in some ways, it's important to understand about many of the supplements that are out there and being touted for, you know, potential benefit in the fertility space. The one thing about dietary supplements is that you don't need a prescription to get them, right? Right. Yeah. And so you made the very valid observation that there aren't a lot of randomized placebo-controlled trials for some of these interventions. And the reason why that is the case is because it's notoriously difficult to get couples who are going through fertility treatment- To randomize to a placebo. To accept a placebo arm of, a, uh-huh. of, a, of an intervention that they can buy down the street, okay? So if you give them an informed consent and it basically says, we think that coenzyme Q10 may have some real benefit in improving your egg quality. And we may or may not give it to you. (laughs) Right, exactly. Most couples say, hey, thank you for this information. I'll go buy my own. (laughs) Right, exactly. So that is why it's very difficult to do these clinical trials. So what happened with CoQ10 is this. We know that one of the most important factors in terms of the quality of an egg is how much energy it can produce during what's called meiosis, okay? And what happens when an egg is formed uh, is that the number of chromosomes have to be cut in half. And the process by which the chromosomes, remember we have 46 chromosomes, right? And that's actually 23 pairs of chromosomes. So you have a pair of chromosome one and a pair of chromosome two. And what happens when an egg is formed is those pairs split, okay? And the egg ends up with only one copy of each pair. Then the sperm comes along with its own copy of that pair. And you end up with an embryo that's got 46, whereas the sperm and the egg each have 23, right? The process by which the egg divides the pair so that there's only going to be one copy of it left in the egg requires a huge amount of cellular energy. That energy is produced in the mitochondria of the egg. And there's a compound in the mitochondria called coenzyme Q10. We make our own coenzyme Q10. It's a substance that's found in every cell in our body. And 
What happens is as a woman gets older, the amount of coenzyme Q10 that her eggs have decreases. And therefore, the amount of energy that that egg can produce decreases. And therefore, the ability to split that chromosome pair and end up with only 23 chromosomes in the egg starts to go down. And when, when that happens, mistakes are made and in egg production. And an egg might be ovulated where instead of having 23 chromosomes, it has an extra one, 24. Maybe one of those pairs, the, there wasn't enough energy to pull the two apart, the, the pair apart. And so the egg ended up with an extra chromosome maybe an extra copy of chromosome 21, okay? Which is then, if that gets fertilized, it's a risk of Down syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. That's, you end up with, the sperm brings along a 21 chromosome, the egg has two by mistake, and now you end up with three, which is what we call trisomy 21. So the point is that an egg that doesn't have enough energy could end up with one chromosome too many or one chromosome too few. It could have 22 instead of 23. And that condition is called aneuploidy. An aneuploid egg is an egg that doesn't have the right number of chromosomes. If it's the 21st chromosome, that egg can fertilize and you'll end up with a baby that has Down syndrome. But for most of the other chromosomes, almost all the other chromosomes, the egg just won't fertilize. And so th this is the most common cause of infertility. Correct me if I'm, I'm I'm wrong in, in any of it. <laughs> no, it's a big part of what we talk about, for sure. Okay. It's the most common cause of infertility in women as they're getting into their late 30s and early 40s. It's not that they're not making eggs. It's that the quality of the egg genetically is not correct. It's not there. And so there was a doctor up in Toronto, a reproductive endocrinologist, who figured out that maybe if he supplemented coenzyme Q10, he could improve egg quality in women who are at risk of not having enough energy uh, in their eggs to produce a good quality egg. So this doctor, whose name was Casper, Dr. Robert Casper, he started off working with mice. And it turns out that mice, I guess mice only live to be about two. Okay, that's like an old, so an, an old, old mouse. mouse, an old <laughs> mouse is a mouse that's like one, okay? If a mouse is like a year old, they have the same problem with their eggs being aneuploid. And so his first work was to supplement old mice, that means they were a year old, with coenzyme Q10 to try and help improve the amount of energy that the mouse eggs could make. And he basically restored the egg quality of old mice to look exactly like the eggs of young mice. So did those mice, after he gave them the, the supplement, did they have fewer aneuploid babies? Did they have more yes. pregnancies? Yes. Like, yes, what, yes, yes, all to, of that. And to, to what magnitude? Because you can have, I mean, you know this as well as we do, you can have statistically significant data, meaning it shows that there's a difference, but if you but have- not, But not clinically significant. But not clinically significant. Right. And so nobody cares if it's a 0.1% chance, you know, if it's zero to 0 0.1, whatever. If it's one, you know, if it's zero to three, that's a huge difference. And the way it was described uh, in the paper was that they basically restored these mice to having the same fertility as they did if they were three or four months old. Um, the quality, the, you know, the pregnancy rate and the and the birth rate was essentially indistinguishable from a mouse that was only three or four months old instead of being a year old. How long had they been on the CoQ10 to get that kind of effect? Couldn't have been that long. They don't live that long. <laughs> right. No, I, I think it was about 60 days. And I, and I think they gave the mice the CoQ10 by injection. They actually injected it intraperitoneal. Ooh. So Bob Casper, Dr. Casper, then decided, okay, I'm going to do a clinical trial with CoQ10 in women, Right. Um, and I think they had, this is again up in Canada, they, they, I think they had four sites and their goal was to enroll 50 couples in this clinical trial. And after two years, four sites, they were only able to enroll 20 couples. Wow. And so they uh, discontinued the study. But at that point, the couples, and I think it was placebo versus CoQ10, the couples that had gotten the CoQ10 showed a 35% reduction in aneuploidy in the eggs, but it did not be statistical significance. What dosing did they use? Do you remember in that study? Because that's always a question I get. 200, 400, 600, what's our, what's our dose of CoQ10? The most widely kind of thought of 
dose is 600 milligrams a day. Kind of a lot though. <laughs> well, that, the reason that number got into sort of the medical mind is that that's what Casper used in his clinical trial. And how did Casper get it? He, extra, he tried to extrapolate from what he injected into the mice into a dose for people. The problem with CoQ10 is that it is a very large fat-soluble molecule and absorption from the gut is really poor. And so what we say is what's important is not what you ingest, but what you absorb, okay? So what we've done with our CoQ10, and I'll tell you there are other companies that have done similar things, we've used an emulsification technology. It's what's called a SEDS, S-E-D-D-S, a self-emulsifying drug delivery system. It's from a Swiss pharmaceutical company. And it's essentially what, what it is, is sort of, it's like adding bile salts. You know, when we have to absorb fat from our diet, the body emulsifies the fat in our stomach. The gallbladder secretes bile salts, and those bile salts emulsify the fat and make it absorbable. And so occasionally you'll see a CoQ10 product that's actually a tablet or a capsule with a dry powder in it. The absorption in that form is going to be on the order of 1% to 2%. You'll see CoQ10s that are just an oil-based soft gel. In other words, where it's like rice bran oil or olive oil as a carrier inside the soft gel. Absorption then is going to be somewhere between 2 and 4%. So what we were focused on is trying to increase absorption. And so we use this, it's called Vesasorb. It's from a Swiss company called Vesafac, which is a self-emulsifying drug delivery system. It increases absorption 15 to 17%, which is still pretty low, but it's still like five to six times better than what you otherwise get. Yeah. So for our product, the typical dose is, is 125 milligrams twice a day or 250 milligrams. And that's what's actually on your bottle? Yeah. Each of our soft gels is 125 milligrams. Okay. And that might sound like a very random sort of amount. Like, why not just 100? <laughs> or why not 200? 200, 200. <laughs> How did we get to 125? But the reason is because whenever you're developing a product, you're forced to make a series of compromises. You want to have a product that follows the science. It can't be too big, right? Nobody wants to swallow huge pills. Nobody wants a product that's going to make them feel sick to their stomach. You could formulate the best product in the world, but if people can't tolerate it, what good is it, right? Mm -hmm. And so the 125 milligram soft gel is because that's the largest soft gel that we felt was reasonably sized. That's the most we could get of the CoQ10 plus the emulsification agent uh, into a reasonably sized soft gel. Hmm. And so that's, it's still a, a fairly small soft gel. It's a uh, nicely tolerable. And you have that as a standalone product. Do you have, you probably have other products with coenzyme Q10 mixed in or? Well, we have it as a standalone product. Yes. It's called Neo Q10. And then we also have a prenatal vitamin, which is called Ovavite. And what Ovavite is, it's a prenatal vitamin that's sort of intended for women where egg quality is potentially a concern. So we, we always are try to be very careful about Naming a particular age. <laughs> That's a smart thing, Mark. Smart thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, but, you know, if, if aneuploidy is a concern, supplementing CoQ10 is potentially going to improve egg quality. And so the, I was going to say Ovavite is a tablet, which has a, it's, so it's three pills a day. It's a standard prenatal tablet with high dose vitamin D methylated folate, all the things that you would want preconceptionally, plus two soft gels of the Neo Q10. And so you get 250 milligrams of high absorption CoQ10 and uh, a standard prenatal tablet as well. Yeah. So with your urology background, I have a question for you. We always say, tell women, you know, you're born with all the eggs that you'll ever have. And, you know, they sit in your body for this period of time and all of a sudden they have to wake up and divide. And, you know, that's kind of the problem. Well, so with men, we always say, well, you know, you make sperm every 72 days or whatever it is, and you have young new sperm, but the young new sperm still comes from old guys so, <laughs> in theory. So why do you think there's not as big of an issue with things like coenzyme Q10 in an older guy? Or is there? I mean, is there a reason for somebody's husband to be taking coenzyme Q10? There's actually pretty good data on CoQ10 and male fertility from two perspectives. One is energy production. Okay. What sperm have to do is swim. Okay. And they have, and they have, and they have to swim effectively and, and, um, and reach the egg, obviously. Of course, in those situations where they're getting help, okay, whether it's, you know, with ICSI, 
where the sperm is going to be injected into the egg, you know, and it doesn't have to really swim too far. It may not be that important. But the other feature that CoQ10 has is it not only is important for energy production in the egg and in sperm, but it's also an antioxidant and it's a very potent antioxidant. One of the sources of confusion about coenzyme Q10 is that CoQ10 comes in two different forms. One form is called ubiquinone. Yeah. The other form is called ubiquinol. And it turns out that that's the same molecule, except one is the oxidized form and one is the reduced form. And there's a lot of marketing nonsense, a lot of marketing hype out there that, oh, this form is better than that form. You should use this. You should use that. Uh, it turns out that the body converts back and forth between ubiquinone and ubiquinol constantly. They're, they're what we call a, a redox pair, R-E-D-O-X, a redox pair reduction and oxidation. And what happens is in the mitochondria, coenzyme Q10 transfers an electron, right? That's down the electron transfer chain. That's how energy is being produced. Man, I feel like we're talking about biochemistry here, Mark. I'm having bad <laughs> flashbacks here to, to college or organic chemistry. No, so, so, so it goes from an oxidized state to a reduced state and then back to an oxidized state to a reduced state as it transfers that electron. So it's constantly going back and forth between those two forms, ubiquinol and ubiquinone. But do they matter? No, it does not matter. doesn't matter which form you take. So don't pay more money for the ubiquinone as, as opposed to the ubiquinol then. Right. Well, typically ubiquinol is more expensive because it's the one that is more has been more recently developed and it's the one that they'll, they'll call themselves body ready, Yeah. which is, uh, it's kind of just marketing stuff. And actually the vast majority of clinical trials that have been done with coenzyme Q10 have used ubiquinone. Okay. I mean, if you want to get a good sense of how potentially beneficial coenzyme Q10 is, there was a clinical trial that was a huge clinical trial that was published about seven years ago in patients with congestive heart failure. And they were supplemented with either coenzyme Q10 or placebo. And the coenzyme Q10 group had statistically and clinically significant benefits in terms of less hospitalization, less death, better function in terms of their ability to exercise. Um, and so coenzyme Q10 helps with heart muscle energetics the same way that it, it helps with sperm and egg energetics as well. I had just an anecdotal story. I had a patient one time who never had normal blood pressure. She couldn't tolerate any blood pressure medicine that she was on. She was going to do IVF. And so, and she was 40-ish, 38, 40, somewhere in that range. And, and so I put her on coenzyme Q10. About six weeks later, I get a call from her family practice doctor. And he's like, tell me about this coenzyme Q10. She walked in and her blood pressure was 120 over 80. And I have never in my career or never in the time we've been together, seen her with a normal blood pressure. And, you know, who knows if it was all that, but I mean, he, that's the only thing she had changed when she'd started taking 600 of coenzyme Q10. And, and it apparently has some issues with vascular reactivity. It helps vascular reactivity in people with high blood pressure. I, I think that's true. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, so coenzyme Q10 is a it's a it's a really interesting compound. One other thing I'll mention, and that is anybody who's taking a statin a cholesterol medication like Lipitor, Zocor, Provacol, which are they're all like now generic, but those drugs, the enzyme that they block, it's called HMG CoA reductase. That enzyme is the enzyme that produces cholesterol in our bodies. And so by blocking that enzyme, it lowers cholesterol. But that same enzyme. HMG CoA reductase is what produces coenzyme Q10 in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And so anybody who's taking a higher dose of statins, if you're taking 10 milligrams a day, it's probably not a big issue. I think my husband needs to start taking some CoQ10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so people, well, people who are taking 20, 30, 40, you know, 20, 40, or even higher doses of say Lipitor, um, their coenzyme Q10 levels in their tissues are significantly lower. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's something that you should consider supplementing. Yeah, that might be a good thing for husbands. Most women that we see, they're trying to get pregnant. We want, we try and get them off statins, but certainly for partners, that's an important thing to know for sure. Yeah. Well, this has been an amazing discussion. I've learned so yeah. much about vitamins, about CoQ10, about all kinds of stuff. I mean, this is, this is amazing. We, we really, really appreciate you, Mark, for coming and joining us today. And, and we hope you'll come and see us again. Sure. No, absolutely. It's been my pleasure. A uh, ton of stuff we can talk about. Everything from uh, cannabinoids to, uh, you know, PCOS stuff, whatever you like. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Well, to our audience, thank you so much for listening and be sure to tune into us next week for more. Also be sure to subscribe and leave us a review in iTunes. We'd love to hear from you. We are also on Instagram and Facebook. So please hop on and leave us a like or a follow and say hello. And you can also visit us on fertility.suncensored.com to submit specific questions. All questions will be answered on the podcast anonymously for our Ask the Doctor segment. So don't hold back. As always, this podcast is intended for entertainment and is not a substitute for medical advice from your own physician. All right, guys, we'll talk to you soon and we'll see you next week. Have a wonderful week. Bye. Bye, everybody. We want to thank Ovation Fertility for sponsoring today's podcast. On the road to parenthood, many of our listeners find themselves in need of fertility testing, IVF, and other related services, such as egg donation, genetic testing, or gestational surrogacy. Ovation is a one-stop shop for services that many people may need as they go through fertility care. You can learn more about Ovation services for hopeful parents at ovationfertility.com.